Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, Although, this is sort of here. a Thank home you. game for you, right? You're in Berlin? I'm a, I'm a Berliner, yeah, one of the few. Right, but you actually, this is very interesting to me. You spent most of your childhood in Cuba? Yes. Is that correct? Exactly. How yeah. did that happen? Well, there are some family connections to Cuba, so I actually have a Cuban background, half, half Cuban, half German. Great. So we're going to talk after the future of cities, we're going to talk about the future of food consumption and delivery. Uh, but before we start, maybe some background. Um, when did you start Food Panda and what did you do before? Like, how did this happen? Um, so I'm originally from Berlin and uh, I used to be a techie. So I studied uh, computer science, used to be a, a software developer as well. But at one point of time, um, decided to swap roles uh, with one of my closest friends who actually has a business degree, and we were sitting together uh, as part of the Jamba business. Um, so some of you might recall uh, the Crazy Frog, uh, Sweetie the Chick, and I could name some few more. Um, so we were working together and building the Jamba business, um, sitting next to each other, and then we decided to actually swap roles because it felt more natural, even though he has had the business skills and I had the, the tech skills. Uh, it was still, it felt weird, like from a personal perspective. So we swapped roles. Uh, and since then have been uh, like uh, more on the business side, um, working in many different uh, environments and, and, and helping to build um, different, different companies. And um, when we, um, let's say, sold our last business, which was a big online payments uh, company, and that was back in um, 2012, um, I said, I want to do something new, and I want to do something, uh, I think, as many founders and entrepreneurs that is, that is relevant. Uh, something that can get big, uh, something that has a consumer angle, and something where, and then still like the tech perspective got out of me, um, where you can have like technology that helps to change the world a little bit, right? So I'm not thinking it too big, but like having a positive impact on a certain industry. And we have seen that there is one of the biggest industries out there is, is, is the food industry, right? So technology disrupted travel and technology disrupted uh, fashion and uh, technology disrupted um, the way we are, uh, we are ordering taxis and other things. But there's one large industry, which is the food industry, which has up until recently not been exposed to a lot of tech yeah, in a, in a, in a broad, broader spectrum. And we thought, uh, there's a great angle for us with the experience that we have, um, with the team that we have, with the network that we have to leverage our skills and, and, and get into the food universe. And we actually decided not to do it um, predominantly out of Europe, but we decided to do it out of the emerging markets where there are different, uh, there's a different environment, different dynamics, uh, many more younger people, uh, and where food and the food culture is also significantly bigger. Um, and hence the start of uh, Food Panda, which was um, at the very beginning supposed to be an Asia-only play. Um, but given the success in Asia, we then quickly decided to expand internationally as well. Nice. Um, I was actually going to pick up on that because even when you started Food Panda, like ordering food online and getting it delivered wasn't really necessarily a novel idea anymore, um, especially not in Europe. I mean, Takeaway.com, I think, was founded in 2000, something like that. Um, so you looked at it and you said, I can do the same, but in emerging markets where there's still room? Or did you really think you might bring something innovative to the table as well? I think it was a combination of different elements. On the one hand side, yes, that concept already did exist in uh, Western Europe or in, in countries like the US. Um, on the other hand side, we felt um, that there is so much more that you can do um, in order to make the experience become better um, and more convenient. And we also looked right from the start at this delivery angle, right? Because like some of the other platforms, such as like a Grubhub in the US or Just Eat in the UK at that time were like pure marketplace companies. So they were like classified businesses. And uh, we had started Food Panda also with the idea of um, changing the way the food is getting delivered. So the very first order that was uh, fulfilled through, um, let's say, the Food Panda platform was an order that we actually delivered ourselves. Um, so we started um, the business right from the beginning with the idea of getting access to the delivery chain. And nowadays we're running like a hybrid platform where like a certain portion of it is marketplace, another portion of it is like own delivery with us managing the delivery, leveraging our own riders. Um, but I think that was the starting point of what you nowadays see as a, as, as a big disruption in this industry, which is more of the logistic element as well. Right. 
Um, Food Panda scaled uh, very quickly in, in lots of markets at, at the same time, um, which struck me when I was writing about Food Panda in the early days. Um, what I'm wondering is, how, what, did it come down to marketing, or did you have like a competitive edge when it comes to tech? Was it faster? Was it more efficient? Was it more user friendly? Like, what, what was the reason? I think there was um, retrospectively like a lot of um, good reasons to expand uh, that fast internationally, and and uh, we also we also learned a lot from it uh, because some of that was indeed um, maybe like sometimes also a bit too fast. Um, and I think um, we spoke about it also um, many, many different times that the initial perception that we had was um, this one size fits it all, right? So you build tech and you build processes and you build a business that would equally work in all of the different countries, yeah? not only in Asia, but also in the Middle East, in Europe and many other geographies. But I think we got taught differently. Um, and especially when it comes to food, um, the regions are very specific. People value different things. People perceive and, and discover and order food in a different way. And that's why also nowadays Deliver Hero is rather like a network of different companies with different founders with sometimes also slightly different technological concepts as opposed to like an Uber Eats or Deliveroo and some of the others that still maintain this one-size-fits-it-all approach, which might be okay in more of the, the Western markets to unify that but which uh, reaches its limitations when it comes to the more, to the more emerging markets. So uh, while we expanded into those different countries, I think we acknowledged and got to know that there is quite a lot that you need to adjust and optimize um, and respect in terms of the, the, the local market dynamics. Sure. Well, what are some of the differences between those markets? Is it mostly down to culture, the way that they, they process food and eat it, or is it down to infrastructure, getting the food actually to the customer? Like, well, what are the, the typical differences that you encountered? I think it's more in terms of like what do people value most when it comes to like a food marketplace. There are uh, markets such as the German market that are um, basically very price sensitive. Um, so in general, it might be different for all of us sitting here, but Germany is not known to be a market where people care a lot about food quality. Again, I'm not speaking about people in this room and more of the Berlin and hipster and uh, millennium type of um, audience. But like in, in, in the German market, uh, the German market is very price sensitive. So price is, and affordability plays a big role, hence the success of Aldi and, and, and other concepts. Um, there are other markets also more in Asia where the appreciation for food and food quality and what you're eating and how you're eating it and the whole discovery and the psychological element on how you perceive food is, is, is super important. Um, or other European markets where people are prepared to, to, to spend more on food. So, Food is like always in between like quality, transparency, how is it being delivered, uh, how fast is that, how is the price, and those different attributes differ quite a lot from, from market to market. The other thing that obviously differs is the whole infrastructure. Um, so believing that you can rely on, on proper address definitions and postal codes um, um, in all of the different countries of the world is also something that uh, we had to learn the hard way in markets such as Saudi Arabia and, and, uh, and other countries. There is no proper address definition. Um, a Google Maps wouldn't work sufficiently well. Um, so there has been like a lot of proprietary thinking and, and, and technology that we had to develop in order to be able to compete there. Yeah. But those are all problems that uh, I guess any competitor uh, against you also has. Uh, so it's not necessarily unique to Food Panda in that case. Uh, what are some of the mistakes that you made that were specific to Food Panda, especially when you scaled internationally that fast, that you remember making? I mean, I think if we, if we currently look at the world, and I think um, I sitting here and also seeing a lot of like, great and innovative um, uh, new startups, I think we shouldn't forget that the world is getting more and more monopolized. And we are more like um, now subject to what I would call like a economic dictatorship because there are these Alibabas and Amazons of this world um, that are turning more aggressive, more dominant um, than ever before. And I always thought that um, during the food pundit times um, and also now with Deliver Hero um, that we always used to have like a lot of focus on getting access to capital. Uh, raising capital, and I think also a fundamental part of my time during Food Panda has been trying to get access to capital. But if I still compare that against what the likes of Uber and Amazon and Alibaba are putting into this industry and how aggressive they are playing, 
then I wouldn't classify that or consider that as a mistake, but there needs to be, and we could have even had like a much stronger focus on raising capital and getting access to capital. And again, I'm not complaining because Delivery has managed to um, turn, pu turn public and, have, and, and, and having like a sufficient capital base. But I think nowadays um, we are subject and exposed to even more aggressive competition than ever before in whatever sector. And I think the need for capital and the focus on capital um, is, is, is or should be higher than ever before. And that's why also retrospectively one of the big, big learnings has been to not underestimate that. We had a good focus on that, but I think we could have even had like a much bigger focus on that. Right. Um, before we move to Delivery Hero and the future of food consumption, um, a little bit of a big picture question, like how much innovation is there still left in this space? Like how, because it comes down to unit economics at this point. You have a, a certain volume of customers, you expand to new markets, it's uh, sort of the same model all over again. How much innovation is there still left in this space? How can you even change and disrupt this entire model again? I think there are different, different innovations happening at this point of time, and I um, often feel that this whole um, food tech universe um, is still a little bit stuck in the past, um, not in the past century, but in the past decade. Um, because we're only touching, uh, let's say, this whole business at a very superficial level yet. Um, I think one of the things that will happen and is currently happening is um, a whole new disruption of this restaurant ecosystem of those uh, preparing food um, and those also sourcing food. Uh, at this point of time, most of the restaurants are sourcing their food without any proper um, basically understanding in terms of the data, without any proper like, uh, technology involved, without uh, like, proper processes involved. And what we currently see is a whole new evolution of uh, a new type of restaurants, restaurants that start to use technology, that start to use data. We are seeing the evolution of these called like cloud kitchen uh, concepts that are serving only for the on-demand um, segment, that are able to work more efficiently, that are able to expand uh, faster and quicker. So this whole new restaurant ecosystem um, is currently um, changing. Um, and evolving at rapid speed. The other element is that if you look at um, businesses such as ours and, and of some of our peer companies, these are still very, very static uh, products, right? So if we lock onto the app and if we start ordering food, it's a very, very similar experience. However, um, there's a lot of diversity, diversity when it comes to food, but also diversity when it comes to customers' preferences. Um, and millennials, and um, also us, if we're part of it or not, is to be, is to be, is to be decided. They're getting more sensitive. They're getting more personalized. And I think we still have a long way to go to make it like a more personalized experience. We can leverage the data that we are sitting on, the usage data, the behavior data, to make this experience become a hyper-personalized experience. And we're not there yet. It's not yet hyper-local, and it's not yet hyper-personalized, but I think uh, that's something where this industry will ultimately get to, um, and where there is a lot of like, technological disruption um, still outstanding. Great, very interesting. Um, let's go back to Food Panda. At some point, you became part of Delivery Hero. How did that happen? It was one deal in a massive wave of consolidation in the space, um, but I want to know from your perspective, why did you sell in the first place? I think if you can only build a business, um, then it's still like subject obviously to the industry, but in, in, in many industries you will not be able to um, survive if you don't reach scale. Because scale gives you data, scale gives you uh, customers and hence also network effects and continuous uh, scale. Scale gives you access to capital. Um, and hence, scale is the best and, 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 and biggest protection against uh, the more and more monopolized world. And again, we're looking into uh, the likes of Amazon and Uber and Alibaba and Tencent and many others that are covering a very wide range of different industries. So we're not um, seeing the competition with uh, the likes of Takeaway or Deliveroo or others. It's the big, massive monopolized companies that are getting into our markets and that will make our lives become significantly more difficult. 
And in such a world where those type of companies are raising uh, billions and even more billions, I think it's a very romantic um, view and a very romantic belief that you keep on running your company as the founder, as the CEO, and, um, and, and uh, you want to bring it to, succeed, uh, to, to success, but at one point of time you need to become reasonable and rational. And especially when it comes to food and food delivery, which is a highly competitive environment, joining forces um, and um, bringing people together and um, combining scale um, is the best and, and, and most reasonable protection against the likes of um, all the others that I've just mentioned. So I think both Nicholas, um, the founder of Delivery Hero, as well as myself, we, 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 we know each other since quite a long time, and then we decided it makes absolute sense to combine the companies, to combine scale, to combine efforts on fundraising, to, in a combined way, be able to IPO the company, given the scale that we have, the reach that we have, the growth that we have, and that the combination of talents, the combination of teams, the combination of strength is the best possible protection against it. And I also think that um, another important element of how we think we should counter the, the, the competition from the likes of the Tencents, the Alibabas, the Amazons, and others is by not having this kind of like dictatorship that they have, right? They have the founder and they basically, he decides everything, but that you need to have a little bit of um, an environment of having many different founders involved. So Delivery Hero is not a very centrally run business and operation, but it's more like, um, as we often refer to as like the United Nations of food, because in every single region, every single country, we still have the original founders on board. Um, and we see it more as like a tribe of entrepreneurs working together uh, to make it a success um, where we tolerate many more opinions and views and, 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 and strategies as in some of the other um, very like centrally run businesses as a way to, as a way to compete and succeed. Sure. Um, you've mentioned capital and fundraising uh, a couple of times. I think the other aspect of scaling is talent. Um, the mic replacement, um, finding the right people fast enough, being able to hire uh, in, the, in the right places fast enough. Is that still, is that an issue for delivery or at all? Or, because it's a super competitive space. You mentioned this a few times, so. I think it helped, um, it helped tremendously to um, join forces to build like one strong leading company. And it helped a lot also to IPO the company which um, allows you to be recognized uh, and be appreciated also by the overall public sector. Um, so there have been like, some few elements that made like, hiring and us being an employer uh, more attractive in one of the fastest growing uh, environments that you can imagine, which is food, the combination of food and tech. On the other hand side, like, access to talents is, is overall still um, an issue. Um, and it's... Um, increasingly more difficult to find talents. We have the benefit of being now active in 40 countries, so we're not dependent on Europe or Germany or Berlin. Um, we can basically find talents all over, the, all over the world, but I think especially in Europe, and it's also like a very German thing, um, we're not much prepared for the big technological revolution that is, that is happening. Yeah, my son is um, 18 years old, he just did his uh, college degree, his Abitur, and he had the same in school that I had like um, more than 20 years ago. So it's the same type of education that we have in the schools than um, like two decades ago. So we're not preparing upcoming generations sufficiently enough, at least not in Europe. And I think that's a big, uh, that's a big risk factor, and, um, and hence we're still basically not struggling, but uh, finding it increasingly difficult to get access to good talents, not only from a technology perspective, but also when it comes to how you run companies, how you think entrepreneurial, um, how you think about like innovation and many different other aspects. All right. So on that note, what do you, you look at the, the Berlin tech ecosystem, um, what do you see? Do you think it's still exciting? Do you no, think it's, it's competitive? It's, it's, it's definitely exciting and there are a lot of um, there, are a lot of great, um, there are a lot of great companies and great founders out there. I think um, it's, it's necessary that um, there's more scale 
it's necessary that um, more capital flows into, into the city and that um, founders and ideas get access to capital and also more capital. And I think it's also super important to see that as an area of uh, investment. I think in the German public and in the European public, um, and even if you read um, basically things like Gründerszene, they're still too much like profit oriented. In Germany, everything is about like profit. When do you turn profitable? And if you don't run a profitable company, you're getting um, basically into different uh, and, and, and a difficult public reputation. But at times where the world is changing and where customer behavior is changing at exponential speed, the talk should not be about um, profitability and short-term profitability, but long-term success. And I think that is something that in the, in the German and also still in the Berlin ecosystem um, needs to dramatically change. We need to invest, we need to over-invest because others do that as well. And if we don't do that, then we will be last in terms of the technological revolution. Um, and um, again, it's a perception thing. It's a, it's a media recognition thing. And I hope that um, also our colleagues from Axel Springer, um, who, who, who gave the talk earlier today, um, help a little bit with that, to not getting constantly slashed if you run a business that is unprofitable. Look at Amazon and look at many, many other companies. Look at the Alibabas and Tencents of this world, how they have started. They've burned billions. So we are far away from that. And I think that's something that needs to change in this ecosystem, this different recognition, the capital, um, and, and allowing people to actually rather over-invest. Interesting points. Um, speaking of long-term view, as the chief strategy officer, you have to look at Delivery Hero on the long term. Um, where do you see the company in five years? Or how will the world change? And how will the Delivery Hero adapt to that in the next five years? So I think Dara from uh, Uber has said that he wants to build the largest um, food delivery company in the world. I would like to counter that by saying he will have a hard time because he's competing against us. Um, so it's actually our idea and, and, and our vision and our passion to remain and, and, and keep on being the largest food delivery company worldwide. But we do not only want to be like the largest food delivery company worldwide and define ourselves by scale, but we always said that we want to be the company, and coming back to the earlier point, that is the most personal one, um, that cares about every single element, taste, recognition, appreciation of all the different customers. And there's so much diversity in the world that we want to embrace that diversity, that we want to have a hyper-personalized, hyper-cultural experience, um, and want to be the company that stands out by the product that we have, uh, by the experience that we have, and by the innovation component that we have. Um, and we want to embrace um, innovations such as the one we spoke about around the kitchens, looking into how can we partner with a new generation, with the next gener uh, generation of restaurants. We want to look into new and innovative ways of doing delivery, be it by drones, be it by robots, be it by yeah, other sophistication. And we want to look into um, how people will order and perceive and experience food in the future. Right now, it's clicking. Maybe voice ordering comes back at one point of time. So we are open to all of these different technologies, and I think, um, again, capturing that, we want to be the most innovative, the fastest growing, um, the largest and the most personal experience out there. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we have a little bit of time left. Uh, I think we'll switch to the questions from the audience, if you can uh, put up the Slido uh, questions. So I'll start with the first one. Food delivery is a significantly larger environmental impact compared to people cooking their own food. So how are you dealing with this? It's a fair question. So what we are doing is, and um, it's, it's, it's often not known um, to the outside that um, also Deliver Hero partners and or even invests into um, companies that help us solving, for instance, these type of, uh, these type of issues. Um, we recognize that there is a big environmental impact on food delivery. There's packaging. Uh, every delivery carries uh, packaging. And we're currently speaking to a number of uh, companies in that space, and there are not too many yet, unfortunately, um, that are looking into how to prepare um, a more sustainable way of packaging. 
Yeah? Be it uh, packaging that can be better recycled, be it packaging that you can eat, be it packaging that uh, disappears automatically. Um, so we are talking to, I think, a lot of companies in that space. Hopefully we find more companies that innovate in that particular space because, again, there are not too many yet. Um, but we take that point very, very seriously um, and, and, and definitely want to be a role model uh, there as well. Uh, drone deliveries, you mentioned this at the very end. Uh, are you already experimenting with this? Are you actually working on it? Or is it something that you think you will do in the future? I think right now it's more like a PR stunt whenever we, 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 we speak about it. I think technologically it would work, but as you know, um, it's, it's, it's subject to regulation. Um, and I think um, governmental authorities need to come up with a way to um, actually bring that into practice. Um, and uh, that might uh, still require some time. So while the techno technological side is covered, um, I think it still takes a couple of years until we see actually drones flying around and dropping a pizza um, into, into a specific household. Yeah, great. You have 15 seconds left. What's the food that gets ordered the most through Delivery Hero? What's the top one? Um, I think I'm embracing diversity um, a lot. Um, so I'm probably like ordering seven, eight times a week. Um, and uh, I try to um, play around with different, uh, with different kind of uh, elements. So can't, can't fix like one specific uh, item of food now. Cool. Well, thank you very much. It was Thanks very interesting. Thank you.